And one of the things that is so bad today is many of you men here, you also have known the presence of Christ. But now most of your prayer life is nothing but praying just a little and then just realizing he hasn't come and getting up and walking away instead of staying there until he does. It's just prayer of going through the motions. You want holiness in your life? Run to him and stay there. Stay there. My little boy, whenever I'm putting my shoes on and he, he realizes my bags are packed, he goes, Daddy, stay with Ian. Daddy, stay with Ian. Or Ian, go with Daddy. I find myself, even this morning in prayer, going, Father, stay with Paul. Father, stay with Paul. Paul, go with Father. I see so many boys today. And the boy, the boys. As those old men told me, the mark of a man of God is God upon the man. And I don't, I don't want to sound, I just want, I don't want to sound arrogant. I don't want to sound anything else. I just want to say this. That we have the desperate need to be men marked by the presence of God. We have the desperate need. Now there are those extremes, you know. You have these men who, you know, don't care anything about doctrine and they're just all Holy Spirit. Well, they, they, they have nothing to say. But I want you to also know that just, just doctrinal teaching, not the presence and power of God, brings death many times. And he says, come down. But not only does he say, come down, he says, come with me. Come with me. Come with me. I don't like and I don't teach quiet times. The idea of you should have a quiet time. I know that's a big part of discipleship. I don't agree with it. I don't like it. I don't see the Puritans having quiet times. I don't, a quiet time. What, is it like me going home, putting my wife in a closet, and 30 minutes a day I pull her out and talk to her and then stick her back in there? Well, I've went through my checklist now of a good husband, therefore, now go back in the closet and here I go again. Our entire life, every moment of our life should be one of being with the Master. It is very hard to call up pornography sites on the computer when Jesus Christ is there. It's very hard. And you need to realize, we as, uh, well, uh, those of us who are Baptists, we need to realize we have been so influenced by Popish, Roman Catholic ideas of piety, it's unbelievable. There is no such thing in the new covenant of secular and sacred. It is all sacred. Even the pots and pans are sacred. Everything is sacred. Someone asked me one time, you want to go to the Holy Land? I said, everywhere I bow my knee is the Holy Land. Everywhere Christ is, is holy. And it's not just learning things about, about holiness and learning things about principles, but it's also coming down and just walking with Him. Walking with Him. I remember after I was, after I was born again, and the love of God had been shed abroad in my heart. You know, there's that time that you seem to walk with God when everything is God. Everywhere you look, you just can't even stop thinking about Him. And I remember several, well, probably two or three months went by. And it was just like that after my conversion. I mean, just everywhere, all I could think about was Jesus. And then I remember one day walking into a store thinking about buying some new boots. And I walked out of the store. I have never been so broken in all my life. I realized that I walked into that store and Christ was not in every thought. Christ was not in just everything. And I thought, what happened? Do you know what's terrifying? Is when that becomes so common it no longer even bothers us anymore. That's when unholiness and immorality and such things can creep in. When Christ is not real. Christ is not real. I didn't even want to come out of the prayer thing. Just wanted to stay there. Why? That's what we need. You men, most of you know more than I'll ever know. The thing about it is, are we seeking Him? Are we seeking Him? Are we seeking Him? Do we pray and nothing happens and we get up and we realize, well, we've, we've, you know, we've been obedient, we've prayed. You know, we're two or three gathered, here, He's here. I need more than that promise. I want His presence. I want His presence. Now, I did not mean to tarry that long on, on that verse. I, I want to go on to some other things. Look at verse 7 prior to verse 8. When he first addresses her, before her, he tells her to come down from those things which can hurt her. And before he says, come and follow me, this is what he says about her. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Many times you, you, you come to see that you're walking in a place you shouldn't be walking or living in a way you shouldn't be living and immediately condemnation comes upon you. 
And that condemnation drives you farther away from, from Christ. You feel ashamed. You feel like it's, it's a works idea of, well, I've got to you know, get my life fixed, do this and everything, and then kind of earn some brownie points and then come back. And we have so much old covenant teaching and do not realize about the new covenant some things that are so beautiful. Christ really did pay it all. He really did pay it all. And when you come to the realization the Holy Spirit has convicted you in your heart that you're wrong, you should not be listening then to the devil who begins condemnation and everything else and tries to drive you further and further away from the Savior. When the Lord tells you you're wrong, He says also, He says it like this, He goes, you're wrong. I love you. Come back. You're wrong. You are without spot before me. Come back. I love you. We have this idea that, well... We need to be very, very careful when we start telling Christians that when they sin, their fellowship is broken with God. You need to be very careful about what you're saying. Clichés can be very dangerous. Because according to 1 John, fellowship with God is synonymous with salvation. We claim we have fellowship with Him. That's talking about salvation. You tell a believer their fellowship with God is broken, you're basically saying you're condemned and going to hell. What you need to realize, you have taught maybe your people and you believe yourself. You tell your people, if you sin, man, you're separated from God. Your sins have separated you and God. Oh, really? You ever thought about what you're saying? You're separated from God, my friend. You're going to hell. You're separated from God. You're condemned. Now, I'm not trying to play down sin. What I'm just trying to tell you is we better clean up our language. You want to know what happens when a believer sins? God continues to love them. God continues to woo them. God continues to come after them. God continues to draw them. Let me give an example. Let's say that God wants me to fast, pray, and read the Word all morning. But I want to go out to my wood shop and work. According to many fundamentalist pastors, this is what's going to happen. God's going to stand there and say, Well, you just go ahead and go to your workshop if you want, but I'm not going with you. And by the way, I hope you cut your fingers off. You know what really happens? I'll tell you what happens. I go out to that workshop. God is screaming at me. I love you, Paul. I love you. Nothing will change that. Come away with me. I'm looking for a board. He goes over there with me and helps me find it. He said, Paul, here's the board. But I love you. Come away with me. I turn on that power saw. He guards my fingers. And when I look across that saw at the other side of it, he's standing there going, Paul, I love you. I love you. I love you. Come back with me. Come back with me. You say, well, what about discipline? Oh, my dear friend, there is discipline. There's church discipline. There's divine discipline. There's all sorts of discipline, but it is always in love. And it is always with God screaming out to His children, I love you, I love you, I love you. And so when we talk about, well, we're here and we're in this, we're in this mess we've got ourselves into, Satan will oftentimes intervene and say, now, God don't want anything to do with you. He's over with doing anything with you. If you're a true believer and you have fallen into some sort of sin, condemnation from the devil will be constantly coming towards you, driving you further and further from the Christ, further and further from salvation. And what you need to hear is, Son, it is finished. I've paid the price for you. Your sins have been paid for. Return to me. Return to me. Return to me.